looking back uh, to March 2020, can we reflect on the market sell-off? Richard, your views and what happened and going forward? Yeah, I think, I think Andrew, it's, it's been a unique uh, market environment in the sense that we've had, a, in effect, a 100-year event with, with the corona uh, pandemic. Uh, I think from a, purely from an investment perspective, reflecting on the lows reached in March of this year, if you look at global economies, as a consequence of the hard lockdowns that ran across most of the world, you established a, a, an economic base uh, whether it was manufacturing or consumption, whatever it may be, of unprecedented levels. I mean, in some countries, the entire expansion that started from 2009, pretty much up until the 20, 2019, a large, a significant amount of that was wiped out as a consequence of the lockdowns. So I think that's quite a key observation. Moving forward, we've got, we, we, we've got to recognize the fact that, earn, that um, both earnings as a consequence of the contraction and the fact that economic bases are so substantially low right now, that the ability for synchronized growth going forward, at least for, for the medium term, is, is very, very likely. So what that means for us is, in, under periods of, of strong synchronized growth, we can expect equities to typically outperform bonds. We'd expect bonds to be laggards going forward, particularly global bonds, where, where their, their yields are, are about as low as they've ever been. Um, so um, again, with synchronized growth, we would expect commodity prices to remain buoyant and to continue to rise. With that, typically the dollar is a weak currency. We have acknowledged the dollar has been overvalued for some time. So that talks to emerging markets looking quite, uh, quite attractive. Um, so uh, resources uh, forms quite a large uh, component of our portfolio. And then I, I think that perhaps the slightly more uh, controversial aspect will be our uh, now focusing on some of the domestic counters. We think the RAND is deeply undervalued. Uh, it can appreciate going forward. And with that, with a significant unwind of consumption within South Africa, we think some of these unloved and, and very cheap domestic counters can start to show some relative resilience as well. So we've, in a sense, got a barbell strategy where we've got resources on one end, and then we've been buying more recently some of the, 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 uh, the uh, domestic uh, counters to, to augment that. And Royce, your reflections on the past and how you guys fared? And I think there's been some, some valuable lessons that we've learned over the process. Um, if we just look at, at what happened, we weren't positioned um, at all for, 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 for COVID. We were ironically positioned for a growing um, global economy. So when COVID struck, which is a one in a hundred year event, um, our positioning was just simply wrong. And given that we had the fastest sell off in the history of markets, um, a 35% decrease in the S&P in two weeks, we simply didn't have time to readjust the portfolios. And I think some of the lessons we learned, um, there was a roadmap earlier on called China. Um, China was ahead of the world in the COVID. Um, and we thought the China experience would be replicated by the, the democratic West, if you want to call it that. And I think this is one of the, the lessons we learned. Um, China isn't the West. Um, and that's why uh, the coronavirus is still alive in the world around the globe. So going forward, we'll be very careful to not make that mistake again, to replicate the dynamics within China um, within the dynamics of the rest of the world. I think another fact which, which, which has come to fore is the, the economies that could afford to, to provide support to their citizens, and this is mostly the developed world, um, were able to do so. Um, obviously, this has come at a great cost. And one of the... the, the, the the end results of this is the increased levels of debt. And that's certainly going to be with us for the next decade, um, is how the first world is going to repay the debt that's been borrowed um, to support their populations via COVID. Allied to that is emerging markets, which have borne the brunt of, um, of, of, of COVID. They simply don't have the deep pockets that the first world has um, to provide underlying support. Um, and this has really wreaked havoc amongst the, the weaker emerging markets. Unfortunately, that includes South Africa and all the structural issues that this country is facing. Unfortunately, um, we're brought forward by five or six years um, and we have to deal with them now. We're all well versed with the, with the, the fiscal cliff, the government finances. Um, and, you know, these dynamics have been brought forward and, 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 and you know, are being addressed by the, in the markets as, you know, as we speak. So, you know, looking back, a very, a very stark contrast between China, developed world, and emerging markets, and unfortunately, the, ram the negative ramifications for South Africa. 
Richard, Royce, thank you so much for your time today, sharing your knowledge and more about Obsidian Capital. Glad to see you, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. We appreciate your interest in our product range and our business. Thanks.